Um, my name is Ruth Gregor from McMaster, and uh, welcome to the History Room. So this is our panel on Thinking Labor, <coughs> sorry, Thinking Labor Internationalism Historically. And we have four panelists, I'll introduce all of them. Um, so I want to start out introducing David Gujar. His talk is entitled Labor Internationalism and Historical Perspective, the Role of the Spanish Civil War. David teaches in the School of Labor Studies at McMaster. His research and teaching interests include labor history, political economy, immigration, human rights, and the living wage. David's research, um, I was saying that he's currently finishing a biography of a Canadian veteran of the International Brigades in the Spanish Civil War. So as Ruth mentioned, the focus of my talk is on uh, the Spanish Civil War, and in particular, <coughs> labor internationalism uh, in the 1930s and the 1940s, and perspectives in particular for the I think most relevant for this con uh, conference is perspectives that that brings to contemporary issues as well. I'm going to assume a certain amount of knowledge about this, not a really high level, but I'm going to uh, assume a certain amount. Uh, but I will begin with some basic background information, uh, biography, a brief one of the subject uh, that I'm writing the biography of and his story. Um, so the topic is a man by the name of Hans Ibbing. Uh, this was a particular challenge. I'm going to take a risk with the technology and hope that it can move from one place to the other here. Uh, there he is. Uh, that's him there in Spain in 1937. Uh, he was born in Germany and he was raised in a social democratic household in Germany. Uh, he left in 1930 for Canada, in part because of the rise of the Nazis, in part because the conditions were so bad in Germany. Uh, and then he survived the worst of the Depression in Winnipeg uh, in the early 1930s. Uh, he rode the rails briefly in 1933, but most of the time he had a regular job. He was a truck driver um, for a butcher shop in the early 1930s. He was not a political person until he became politicized in the mid-1930s. He became a communist. Uh, and then he decided he had to go to Spain in 1936. And he finally got there in the beginning of 1937. He joined the International Brigades. This is uh, him in Spain. You can see the Spanish signage in the background there. Uh, he, because of his background, and in part because he went before the Canadian Brigade, the Mackenzie Papineau Brigade had been formed, uh, he was a truck driver there as well. He drove the transport regiment. It was called the Vesson of the Train. That's him at the back of the truck there, unloading the truck um, in Spain. Uh, and so the International Brigades, uh, a total of about uh, 35,000 people from other countries came to Spain to fight to defend the Republic against Franco and his allies, which was Nazi Germany and Fascist Italy. Uh, the International Brigades um, were mostly uh, communists, although there were some non-communist contingents as well uh, within the brigades. And um, uh, he was there until the end of 1938. Uh, when the Republic started to collapse. Uh, he was decommissioned in September of 1938, had an enormous struggle to get back into Canada, which he eventually did at the end of 1938. And then when uh, the war years came, he, this is, uh, when the war years came, he uh, continued his anti-fascist activity in Canada. He moved to Toronto in 1940. He got a job as a pressman at the Communist Press, the Ever Ready Press, which put out communist material at this time. And he also worked as, a, uh, uh, as, a, as an activist in a German-Canadian organization called the German-Canadian Federation, which is a communist-allied organization, an anti-fascist organization that put out all kinds of material. So I've been writing that, this biography for a number of years now. It's been uh, quite a challenge, but also enormously rewarding. And I think it, on the question of labor internationalism, it brings a lot of perspective, I think important perspective, on some labor internationalist questions. The first set of things I want to explore briefly, toggling back to here, are some of the conditions, some of the ways in which an international consciousness and very high levels of international commitment get generated and how his story, his experience, and the experience of many volunteers to go to Spain um, lend perspective on this. First of all, the impact of the global economic crisis. In many ways, the 1930, we think today, uh, 21st century is the age of globalization, uh, or at least certainly the late 20th century. 
Uh, the time we're in now is a high level of globalization. In some ways, the economy in other parts of experience in the 30s and 40s was more globalized than now. Um, you, would all, you wouldn't see that if you associate globalization only with trade. But in, trade is not the only economic phenomenon that can be globalized. Depression can be too. And in the 1930s, it was a truly global depression. And because it was a, clearly, a truly global depression, people looked for international answers. And many people, like my subject, Hans Zibing, looked to the Soviet Union in the 1930s as an example of a model, an economic model, that could get uh, capitalism out of the crisis that it was in. Because in this time period, it seemed that capitalism had failed on a global scale. And so they looked for alternatives. Now, of course, they didn't have all the information about what was happening in the Soviet Union at this time. They didn't have uh, the knowledge of the costs and the, the atrocities that were happening. But for many people, not just on the far left, including a lot of liberal, social democratic figures in Canada and elsewhere, the Soviet Union was a model in that time to deal with the economic crisis. Uh, second important point is global political forces. Um, and this is an important, uh, particularly important point when we deal with internationalism as compared to uh, today. Uh, Eric Hobsbawm, the great Marxist historian who died a few years ago now, I think rightly talked about how the real contradiction of the last 20 years we've lived in is that in many ways the economy is globalized, but politics tends to be incredibly parochial. It is true that we have a kind of international populist phenomenon now, but the content of that populism is inward looking, it's nationalistic, it's incredibly parochial when it's logically coherent at all. Uh, and so you don't get these globalized political forces on the same scale in the 1930s that you did. You had a truly globalized uh, set of political forces uh, that were having a very big impact. As Hobsbawm also says, the 30s and 40s in particular are characterized by a kind of uh, international ideological civil war uh, between right and left, between liberalism and anti-liberalism, um, along a number of cleavages. And this uh, civil war drew in an awful lot of people, and Spain was one of the first front lines in that struggle. And it truly was an international uh, uh, phenomenon in that way, because you had the international brigades, people came from all over the world, especially the Western world, certainly all over Europe, uh, all over other places. The country that was most closely aligned with the Spanish Republic was Mexico, which ended up taking in large numbers of refugees after the war. So that's on the one side. And on the other side, you had the forces of fascism and Nazism. The Germans lent crucial support to Franco's survival at the beginning of the war. And over the course of the war, uh, Italy was even more of a committed supporter. It sent, over the course of the war, 75,000 troops uh, to help uh, fight on Franco's side. So you have these truly globalized uh, political uh, forces. Um, and uh, it, just related to that as well, on the kind of intellectual level, Spain was one of those issues in the 1930s that drew in artists, intellectuals of all kinds, not just communists, but also others as well, social democratic, liberal, and so forth, drawing into this uh, uh, kind of uh, international uh, political debate. And so the attention, of the, uh, the attention of large parts of the population was drawn to it. And that was why from a very early stage, if you were an anti-fascist, and my subject, hence it being, he was uh, involved to a large extent because it was about fighting fascism for him. That's why he joined the communists. One of the main reasons why he joined the communists because they were the leading opponents of fascism at this time. <laughs> Going to Spain was the logical thing to do. So you get this real internationalization of politics. Okay? Now, what is interesting as well is, on the one hand, these are global international forces uh, at work. So on one level, it seems very abstract, very large scale, very sweeping. But the connection to community organizations was also extremely important. That is to say, these are larger global phenomena, but you can see them being manifested in very local community group organizations. Local community groups in Winnipeg, there was all kinds of political activity in Winnipeg uh, at this time. And in immigrant communities, you have communist organizations, socialist organizations, drawing to a large extent on the radical roots in a lot of the homelands these immigrants came from, uh, and very strong communist organizations or communist allied organizations take hold in the Ukrainian community, in the Finnish community, and in the German community. It's smaller in the German community because the 
far left contingent in the German community was smaller, but it was very active by the 1930s. And like many people who become radicalized in this time period, uh, my subject, Hans Zibbing, he first just joined local community groups. He went to the local community hall. He participated in social events, what a number of historians call hall socialism. He participated in that. And um, uh, it, it was through that that he first became active. And then he became increasingly political. So you get this combination of a very high level of community engagement, but also with the larger global issues. Because what do they start talking about as they become political? They start talking about these larger global forces. So you get the larger sweep and you get uh, the smaller community focus. Connected to that as well, and uh, uh, also encouraging a sense of an international consciousness, is the sense of rootlessness. And what we're talking about here is the economic conditions in the 1930s were so bad that it was hard for people to lay down roots. It's hard for them to get steady work. It was hard for them to stay in the same place. You get thousands and times tens, hundreds of thousands of people drifting. Riding the rails, and um, my subject uh, rode the rails a couple of times. But especially for recent immigrants. In Canada, there was another large wave of immigration in the 1920s. Uh, in the late 1920s, he came right at the tail end of that wave of immigration. And for those people in particular, it was hard for them to start families, to own property, to do any of those things to make you feel rooted in one place. And for that reason, therefore, it is a lot of those more recent immigrants who feel that sense of rootlessness who make up a lot of the volunteers for the international brigades. Canada's uh, contingent of volunteers is marked by a higher number of recent immigrants than you see in other places, particularly in the United States. That's in part because the United States had cut off immigration in the 1920s, uh, in the period that Donald Trump likes to refer to. That's what he's talking about. Some, well, I don't know if he's aware of that. So let's not get into that. <laughs> Um, but anyway, the U.S. had cut off immigration in the 1920s. But um, uh, for the uh, group that, uh, that had come in, it was very hard for them to lay down roots. So a lot of the time, those are the people, at least some of them. And there's also a large contingent of unemployed uh, people uh, who, uh, who came as well. Although not as many as is often said. Uh, my subject, Hans Zibbing, as I mentioned, he, had, he did have a regular job. Okay, uh, for the purposes of time, especially because we started late, I'm going to skip the challenge of the popular front because it's a little bit more complicated uh, one and we just don't have enough time to get into everything. So I want to end on these two issues which I think are particularly important when it comes to perspective for today. One is the question of force and power. And what I'm talking about here is what marks the 30s and the 40s to a large extent was the sense citizens had that they could take up arms or go out into the street or engage in that kind of physical confrontation with uh, capitalism. Now, in terms of how that was uh, dealt with, there are many parallels between the 1930s and today. Uh, protests, especially in Canada, um, was, well, not just Canada, but a lot of places, but Canada certainly the case, protest was met with force. Most, a lot of the major protests in the 1930s were simply put down by force. The Ottawa Trek, even smaller protests, or strikes like Esteban, uh, the Vancouver Post Office Occupation 38, all these cases uh, are happening. However, there was also a sense for a lot of people that they could volunteer, they could go fight in Spain, and in the 1940s, another thing that you see coming out in the literature from uh, my subject's organization, but many organizations, is the sense that it's a citizen's army that's fighting and taking on Hitler. That was not entirely the case. It wasn't just average people in uniform, truly to the fullest extent. But there was an element of truth to that, enough that the communists could say with full conviction it's a people's war, to the extent that Unions could say we have a, a worker-soldier alliance. Soldiers are fighting Hitler abroad. Workers are fighting the Hitlers of management at home. Yes, they actually use that term. Uh, you get a higher proportion of uh, people in the military voting for the CCF than in the general public. So there's an element of, you know, mobilized people in, in the army. Today, this this uh, this formulation is much different. You have militarized police to such a great extent, which is one of the biggest political issues. You have um, such comprehensive systems of surveillance and monitoring. 
you have a military that's a much different proposition than we're talking about uh, in this time period. And even, you know, somebody with as good credentials as a Marxist as David Harvey has said, this formulation changes the way we should be thinking about this. Because in terms of the monopoly of force, you have such a comprehensive monopoly of force on the side of the state and capital that we do need to think our, our tactics through a little bit differently. And I think that is one important perspective. Lastly, on uh, a quick note, the other real contrast that leaps out in this time period is the extent to which, even though conditions, I think, by almost any rational standard, were worse than, than they are now, the sense of hope. The sense of hope was there, especially because there were lots of inspiring ideas. There were visions, there were models that people had faith in. The CCF was putting out all kinds of new ideas. The New Deal was a relatively new innovation, not entirely, and of course, as I mentioned, a lot of the communist ideas. And it's the importance of those ideas that I think especially really need to think about. So I want to end also on a little bit of an encouraging note uh, as well. The last picture here. This picture, so my subject, Hans Sibbing, we often feel discouraged by the times we're living in now. He, by the time he was 38 in 1945, the economy had been good for a few years in the 1920s, but he himself had never known a stable economy, certainly not in wartime, outside of wartime. Uh, he had never known stability very much at all. There were very few periods where people were killing each other or even have movements like fascism rising. But after that time period ended, he enjoyed a life of relative prosperity, good steady work, and so forth, and good health. This is him shoveling snow in a big snowstorm in 2007 at 99 years old. So things you can do and sometimes will get better. Thank you.